Go ahead. We few, we mighty few. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thank you for being here. It does work. There you go. Um, my name is Danelle, and I work here at the library. And um, tonight we're very happy to have one of our locals who has written a book come and talk to us. Um, Bill Boardman is a well-respected writer and author who's lived here for decades, a long time. Um, and his current book is very interesting and very timely, and he will tell you all about it. I don't need to, but um, so now if we can all take our little phones and turn them off or silence them and all of those good things. Um, and thank you for being here, and I'd like to introduce Bill Boardman. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Thank you to the library for hosting this. Thank you to the Yankee Bookshop for setting it up and selling a book. Uh, the, on your chair, you may have seen your, uh, your party prizes. Uh, the, the CD is uh, a 2004 compilation for the election that year. Um, that means it's a little dated, but not as dated as you might think. Uh, we're still torturing people, we're still doing all that stuff. Uh, and this is a button I made at about the same time. It's the figure of the Abu Ghraib prisoner with the electrical wires and the American flag upside down, a sign of crisis, which I think we're still very much in. Um, where I'm coming from is that, that while, while Trump is on everybody's mind and very much in our face, uh, he's really just a manifestation uh, of a, a much deeper, widespread, metastasizing spiritual cancer. Uh, and that most of what's going on now has long, deep roots, and whether we're going to get out of it in the 2020 election or not is something else again. Uh, now, this, this gathering is about my book, and the name of the book is Exceptional, and the subtitle is American Exceptionalism Takes Its Toll. Uh, you, you may or may not be familiar with the term American exceptionalism. I, I, I'm surprised sometimes when people don't know what it is. Uh, and for those of you uh, who don't, uh, the introduction of the book defines it this way. American exceptionalism permeates our culture. Americans were taught to believe in American superiority long before we were able to think for ourselves. America is the greatest country in the world, quote unquote. It's an article of faith. It can't be proved. Other countries didn't vote us number one in a free and fair election. What is the measure of greatness for a country? Do genocide, slavery, racism, imperialism, and endemic poverty count? If the United States is really the greatest country in the world, what does that say about the world? Uh, the, the, the beginning of the book, uh, the first thing in the uh, introduction is a way to approach the book. If I were you, I just start reading the book, start anywhere. All of it interrelates in time. You've already lived through all the events I've written about, whether you were aware of them or not. So you've already been introduced to the subjects, or you can let the subjects introduce themselves. I've tried to make everything as accessible as possible, whether you know about it in advance or not. Uh, the book is 750 pages. It's about 120, it's 126 different articles. It's about a third of the total that I wrote during the eight year period that I was working for Reader Supported News. Now, needless to say, trying to prepare 
an 800-page book or thereabouts for an, a one-hour presentation or so uh, made me a little crazy. Er. Uh, so in, uh, oh, I have a quote that I meant to put. Uh, see what I mean? So here's to January 21st, 2021. That's the next inaugural. With hope, but not much optimism. We're in the midst of a presidential election in a country that has been at war all over the world since 2001, and there's no authentic peace candidate. There's no strong anti-militarism candidate in a country where the military budget eats our future. Perhaps worse, America seems more responsive to honoring the dead than ending the wars that kill them. There's little integrity in our public discourse and less coherence. Truth is optional. Our society is out of rational control, apparently unable and unwilling to prioritize what matters. Are we happy yet? <laughs> uh, last night I watched Marianne Williamson uh, who's running for president. Um, it, it's an interesting candidacy since she's hardly a politician. Uh, what is she, more of a spiritual guru than anything? But her performance was terrific. It was at the Yale Political Union. Uh, and it's a very polished performance. She knows, she knows her moments, she plays them well. And according to her, she's a, an, an anti-war candidate. And, that, and she and Tulsi Gabbard are the only ones running against the military industrial complex. Now, I don't know, I don't know if that's really true or not. Um, I do know that Elizabeth Warren has called for an end to US complicity in Yemen. Uh, but I don't know much more than that. There's probably been token of opposition to Yemen, but God knows the Senate has been weak on that. And of course, the president, the one time they did pass a bill, the president vetoed it. Uh, so we're still a year from the next election with no idea how it's going to turn out. None. We're still 100 days more or less from the Iowa caucuses. The 2016 election was something of a revelation for the country, to say the least. And it's a standard cliche to say, that's not who we are. And Joe Biden says he's running to restore the soul of America, or words to that effect. Well, I, I think the 2016 election is who we are as a collective, as a whole country. That's who we've either become or allowed ourselves to become or allowed others to become in our, in our stead. Uh, it, it's not that easy to say it's not who we are. And we'll see, we'll see in this, if this election, 2018 was hopeful. 2018, the, the Democrats and some very good Democrats retook the majority in the House. But the bad news from 2018 is that those really good Democrats in the House are opposed for the for great part by the majority establishment Democrats. There's a fault line there that, that one, uh, one person calls the most dangerous factor in the world right now to, to any kind of peace and progress. The opposition of establishment Democrats to any kind of serious change. Uh, the, the 2016 election, in, in May of 2016, and I don't think of myself as a seer, but it, things are there for people to see, they just don't always see them. I wrote, establishment Democrats should be afraid. This is May of 2016, six months before the election. Establishment Democrats should be afraid since almost half the voters allowed to vote in Democratic primaries reject establishment Democratic values. But their shamelessness, the establishment Democrats, their pusillanimity, the obtuse arrogance march on toward a possibly disastrous November that is wholly self-engineered. It's not a, I don't think that's a widely held view, but it's mine. Uh, 
at the same time, May 2016, I wrote a piece uh, headed National Mindlessness. And it starts with a quote from Barack Obama referring to Trump. We are in serious times. This is a really serious job. This is not entertainment. This is not a reality show. This is a contest for the presidency of the United States. And then I wrote, Donald Trump is the greatest threat to America today, or so the conventional wisdom left and right would have you believe. More realistically, the greatest threat to America today is actually believing that Trump is the greatest threat to America today. To believe that Donald Trump is the greatest threat to America today, one needs to be a little hysterical or dishonest or both. Believing in the mortal Trump threat requires believing that the Congress, the Supreme Court, the military, the security state, and all the other agencies of government, as well as the states and most of the populace will suddenly become helpless in, to oppose the White House. That is an imaginary helplessness with no basis in reality, as viciously demonstrated by the Republican Congress of the past six years. For better or worse, the Constitution is designed to enable gridlock. Advanced Trump phobia is mostly political posturing in the President's quote above. The country is drowning in bad faith like this and worse because the country isn't ready to look itself honestly in the mirror. When your political system produces bad results, it's too easy to cynical and dishonest to blame the results. That's just politics. Politi the intellectual integrity is quite a different orientation, one that is in short supply in a country in the near death grip of decades of national mindlessness. Now that, I, I may have come on too strong about Trump there, but uh, I would only dial it back. I wouldn't retract it. Um, I mean, the situation we're in right now, there is resistance, but it's limited. Uh, the Democratic uh, attorneys general have been very strong. Uh, elements of the federal courts have been very strong. Uh, but there's not much more going on now that the, ho the House is now in play uh, as of the last election. Um, but how this election is going, I mean, this is a total aside, but I cannot believe that the Democrats are uh, uh, primarying Ed Markey, the senator from Massachusetts, one of the better senators out there. He's got three Democrats running against him, one of them a Kennedy. And you know who's, you know who's behind Kennedy? A guy named Joe Crowley. You know who Joe Crowley is? Joe Crowley's the guy who held his seat in Queens for years without living there and lost to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. So it looks for all the world like payback in the worst, worst political way. Absolutely unprincipled. Uh, and then I, uh, the article, The Mindlessness, I talked about drones for a while, you know, the assassination by drones. Uh, Presidential assassination by autocratic fiat was new in American life when President Bush first crossed the line. Presidential assassination, aka executive action, used to be against even American law. A decade after the first drone strike, the country is in its muddled mindlessness, pretends they are not all proxy assassins. Let me say that again. The country in its muddled mindlessness pretends we're not all proxy assassins. It's, that's too hard to swallow, to admit, to address, to stop, to prosecute. That's reality. It's much easier and less dangerous to pit illusion against illusion to pretend that Donald Trump is a freak out lethal threat to an America that hasn't existed for a long time. That's a reality show for real. 
The president and the people collide in the same unconscionable charade. He doesn't want to tell the truth and the people don't want to hear it. The possibility of healing America continues to recede in the rearview mirror. A nation that creates a torture concentration camp like Guantanamo is not a healthy nation. A nation that maintains a torture concentration camp like Guantanamo is not a healthy nation. A nation that cannot come to terms with a torture concentration camp like Guantanamo and close it down and hold those responsible to account is not a healthy nation. Guantanamo has nothing to do with Donald Trump beyond being another visible symptom of the same metastasizing spiritual cancer. So then we had the election. And we know how it came out. The, the good news was that, uh, the bad news was that Trump won. The good news was that Hillary lost. Uh, and I wrote a piece called, So This Is What a National Nervous Breakdown Looks Like. Nobody won the 2016 election. Elections have consequences, as the cliche goes, and those consequences are unpredictable, perhaps never more unpredictable than when no one wins the election, but someone takes office anyway. What happens to the country is largely, def it, what happens, when that happens, the country is largely defenseless, as we learned so disastrously in 2000. That was when we had five unprincipled Supreme Court justices to thank for promoting an actual but uncounted loser to the presidency. George W. Bush proceeded to reward the country, the country's wary trust, by blithely ignoring warnings of a terrorist attack, then using 9-11 to jingo up the fear-laden public mood and urge us to go shopping while he and a complicit Democratic Congress started wars that have yet to end. For reasons having nothing to do with decency or justice, Nancy Pelosi led the opposition to impeaching this war criminal president who lied us into war. For extra credit, Bush presided over a bipartisan wave of unchecked criminal capitalism that brought the economy to its knees and Democrats to the White House. That didn't help. Barack Obama used his mandate for hope and change to bail out the criminal capitalists and protect them from prosecution. With Nancy Pelosi's collusion, he squandered whatever opportunity there was for an effective single-payer health system, preferring to build a Rube Goldberg health care construct that coddles insurance companies without even insuring everyone. Obama provided little hope or change to Guantanamo inmates or drone victims but he left war criminals and torturers unpunished while expanding Bush-era wars to other countries. Now we have a new wartime president, <coughs> president-elect, who didn't win and who goes unchallenged by the popular vote leader who also lost. Roughly half the country is freaking out at the prospect of a future that seems as inherently dangerous and unfair as it is inevitable. Now those freaking out have, over a Trump presidency have an idea how some hashtag never Trump Republicans felt six months ago at the prospect of a Trump nomination. They got over it. The danger is that we will too. Since November 8th, much of the country seems to have spiraled into a slough of despond, feeling helplessless, helpless, directionless, uncomprehending and hopeless. Even the apparent winners seem joyless in their success, their triumph marked less by celebration than by anger, epithets, Nazi graffiti, shootings, and mad tweets. It's as if everyone knows that there's no one prepared or qualified to take power, but they're going to take it anyway and take it no one knows where. Responding to the Trump triumph with insult and denigration, no matter how valid, is worse than a waste of time. It is an exercise in denial. The Democrats lost this election in just about every substantial and meaningful way, not only by running a corrupt, 
primary process, not only by expecting fealty to a hollow candidate, but by decades of withdrawal from meaningful engagement with too many deserving Americans. Anyone paying attention knew, as early as 2008, if not much earlier, that the country was in ferment and that that ferment needed to be addressed honestly and sub substantively. The scale of Democrats' failure to do that is measured by the rise of the Tea Party in 2010 and now Trump. The country has been hurting for a long, long time, like the tail gunner in Catch-22. And Democrats have treated only scratches while the body politic has its guts spilling out. That's pretty much why no one won this election. There was no one to vote for. We've been in the wilderness much longer than we generally acknowledge. Bigots, bigots didn't put us there. Misogynists didn't put us there. White nationalists didn't put us there. They all may contribute to keeping us there, but capitalists put us there. And capitalists will keep us there until we develop more effective wilderness survival skills. And uh, th one of the things that, that appalled me at, in, in 2008, when Obama was elected, he was elected uh, partly because he had developed a huge effective organization, a grassroots organization. And I just read recently that, that, that I mean, I was appalled at the time because he disbanded it. What's that about? If you want to change things, work with the people who want to change things. You don't send them home. And I read recently that the reason he did that was under pressure from the establishment in the Democratic Party. Because this was a direct, I mean, the Obama hordes, I can't remember the name that he had for, for his, his people, but uh, they were clearly looking for more serious change than the Democratic Party, never mind the Republicans. Uh, okay, I've uh, gone on for a minute, it's been pretty grim. Uh, does anybody want to say anything or shall I just keep grabbing things out of the air? <laughs> okay, yes. Well, I'm just wondering, I'm a Canadian, I live in London, England, and come here two or three months a year. Just to watch the fun. <laughs> just for, for, for the last 25 years, and I'm always gripped by your political scene. We have our own, of course, in England, as you know, the Brexit. <laughs> and Canada has its own, and so, you know, it's, the world is in turmoil. But one thing is outstanding. I watch Fox, uh, NBC, Rachel Maddow especially, and I watch uh, CNN, and in between all that, when the ads are on, if there's no other station that I can get, I'll turn to forensic files. <laughs> but the question is, why is he given so much media time? He dominates the media. And I think, you know, sucks the air out of every other bit of news that's going on. And I, I'm sure that if he didn't have that attention, he might, I don't know, he might not be so... Uh, and I, and what's the word? Our grandizement making of himself. Uh, uh, there's, there's a good, solid, well-expressed capitalist reason for all of that. <laughs> and Les Moonves, uh, who was a, a high-ranking official at CBS, actually said during the campaign, and, and I paraphrase, uh, Trump may be bad for the country, but he's great for CBS. Because he sell, you know, he got guts in viewers. He's a showman. He's putting on a reality show, uh, and he's good at it. Yeah. I, I mean, it's so horrifying, but he's and good all at the crazy it. Crazy stuff comes out five times a day is deliberate. And, and as long as as long as he delivers audiences, the commercial networks are going to go with it. It's just structural. And I think he may have saved the print industry. 
as you know, there's they're still hanging on really because of all this too. Well, well, I, I, I'm not sure. Uh, I think maybe that's true of the Times or the Washington yeah. Post, but from what I read, like hundreds of newspapers have closed. Yeah. Cities as big as Pittsburgh don't have a daily paper. Uh, thousands of, of reporters have been have lost their jobs yeah. and can't find other jobs. So I mean, I think well, yeah, I think, I, just I, I think nationally around. we're looking at a at a at a restricted and, and shrinking uh, print media. Uh, that that takes you to what's happening online, and who knows what's happening online. Uh, we know we know that Mark Zuckerberg, who runs Facebook, uh, says it's okay for politicians to lie in the ads that they run on Facebook. I mean, that's just a policy. And there it is. So there's a guy in, I think it's San Francisco, who uh, put up a false ad saying that Lindsey Graham supports the Green New Deal. And it was very clever. They found, somehow he found, they found a cut uh, of Lindsey Graham saying, like the new Green New Deal. And, and I t edited it with other stuff, and it made it seem like Lindsey Graham was supporting the Green New Deal, which, of course, he doesn't at all. And Facebook took that down because it wasn't true. So the guy who put it up is, has now registered to run for office and has put the ad back up because now he's a candidate. Oh. <laughs> so we'll see. That's, I mean, I think that was just today, but that, how that plays out. Uh, anything else? Well, who's the, who's the uh, Republican candidates going to, you know, uh, 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 rival Trump for the nomination? Or is it just ipso facto that he is the, the only one? God, God. Well, is going against him. Hmm? Who, well, who, who have you heard? Is William Weldon. William Weldon. Well, Bill Weldon. Well. Who's yeah. Yeah. He's the uh, governor of Massachusetts. Uh, yeah, there, and there's another, there's another uh, challenge or two. But uh, realistically, how are the Republicans going to walk away from a winner in, in the sense that they care about. Uh, you know, nobody can be Trump to Trump, basically, until we have a Democratic candidate. Um, and, I mean, the Republican Party is not, not beginning to abandon Trump, right? There, there's what, a handful of people at the fringes? Mitt Romney is our great hope. <laughs> What? He's raised a ton of money too. I mean, oh yeah, yeah. I just saw his, his Facebook fundraising has been better than anybody's anywhere just since impeachment. Hmm. Impeachment has been a huge boon to him for fundraising. Uh, mm -hmm. What? I was thinking that the thread that is very interesting that runs through the book is the exceptionalism links that you make with all of this. And I wondered if you could talk a little more about what you mean by that and how these examples are <coughs> features of what we think of as American exceptionalism. <laughs> you do, do you? <laughs> um, well, the Trump campaign itself was entirely American exceptionalism just permeated with it, right? MAGA, make America great again, is an American exceptionalist trope. Now, it's based on um, the idea that we're not great now, but we were great once, and we're gonna be great again. Mm -hmm. So it's a slight variation. Uh, and I think he plays that frequently. Uh, I can't think of another specific example. Um, Marianne Williamson, in her uh, speech at the Yale Political Union that I saw last night. I'm not sure when she made it. Uh, she was very much American exceptionalist. Her, her take on it was well, the government's bad, but the people are good. I oversimplify probably to her horror. Uh, but basically she was saying, you know, love, love will win. We have just have to be more aggressive in our love. She didn't say aggressive, but assertive, maybe. Uh, and that's an American exceptionalist view. It's also a, a humanist exceptionalist view. Uh, but there's hardly, I think there's hardly a politician since, certainly since Reagan, uh, and even Kennedy, uh, 
who doesn't do you know, the shining city on the hill. We are a shining city on a hill, and all the world loves us. Uh, which is a little ironic because the, I think the, the image initially came from uh, the Bible, the book of Matthew, uh, in, in the section on the Sermon of the Mount. And the idea that Jesus put forward was that you know, we, we are the light of the world and we're trying to you know, let enlighten everyone. And then John Winthrop, uh, who came to this country to found the... Um, Massachusetts Bay Colony put it in a, uh, a sermon just before they, they, or when they were en route, I think, uh, that has been the, the, the main source for American usage, that we would be a city on a hill, and that was the Massachusetts Bay Colony of just a few hundred people. We would be a shining city on a hill. Only his take was, and so we'll have to behave well or the world will curse us. And now it's permutated into this shining city on the hill that everybody's supposed to admire and think is wonderful. But maybe we've come to the curses. Uh, right, that wasn't a full answer, but maybe we'll get back to it. Uh, anything else? So yep. You don't think there's any kind of exceptionalism we can be somewhat proud of, like the Constitution, the rule of law, stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, there are good things and bad things, you know? It's all mixed, right? It's all mixed. You're mixed, I'm mixed. Maybe I'm more mixed up. <laughs> uh, but there's, there, nothing's pure. But we have to have the sense and the intellectual integrity to, to concentrate on what is real. And, and uh, somebody was just telling me about the Oh, uh, uh, Anne McSood's piece on the uh, cl uh, climate change, climate crisis. And in that, uh, she makes much of how people are pulling together to, to do the change and they're real heroes and so on. Uh, and while she mentions Exxon, I gather she does not hold Exxon account to account for 50 years of knowing this was coming, and first lying about it, and then and still resisting it. Uh, I, and that's a that's a perspective that that we don't have publicly. We don't lock up our corporate criminals. We consider them people. Corporations are not people. They are a legal construct. They can't vote. They can't talk. They can commit crimes, but they're not people. And the Supreme Court turned them into people. And then the Supreme Court turned money into speech. Money isn't speech, money is property. Speech is speech. Now the Supreme Court has said gerrymandering is okay. They turned down two cases uh, in which the lower federal courts had held the gerrymandering in two states, I forget which two, uh, was unconstitutional. The Supreme Court just refused to take the case. So it, I don't know how I got off on that, but I mean, you know, we, we are just mind-bogglingly confused as a nation if what we want is the ideals of the Constitution or the Bill of Rights, or the, uh, in the Bill of Rights and uh, the, the Declaration of Independence. Uh, because our, we're functioning on capitalist ideals. Yeah. They seem at odds with each other. Huh? They seem at odds with each other. Well, they, they totally are. But, but this is a country where people were property from the get-go. And sorting that out has been hard. And we're still trying to do it. Uh, so, Bill, what do you think? Do you think that as a nation, we need a, a big disaster to bring us substantial change? Do we, need some, do we need the climate to kind of go down the tubes for us to look at things differently? How do you get everybody to, we've all been uh, lobotomized in many ways. You know, we, we've, um, we go out and buy something and you'll feel better. You know, the whole 
how do you change the, the nation's uh, values? We're always talking about our values. And it's like, what values? Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I wonder, like, if we, your book to me is like pulling a Band-Aid off, you know, and that hurts. Your book hurts. You know, I don't, reading it was like, oh, Jesus, you know, look at us. Look at, look at, and I, and the other side, I want to hear, how do we change? How do, how do you, how do you get something moving? Have we done that in our past? And the Marianne Williamson, she talks a great deal about how the people in the past of the United States have come together around events, whether it was uh, world wars, for instance, and how after a world war there was much more freedom of thought and opportunity and so on. Do we need uh, the climate to go down the tubes for us to kind of actually face what we need to face? Okay. What do you think? I don't know what it would be. Okay. Okay. I, I, Somebody I, I, come back and bomb the hell out of us? I, I, I'm no guru. I'm no seer. I don't know what's going to happen. But it seems to me we've been living through one catastrophe after another and responding mindlessly, really. Yeah. Um, if nobody can eat anymore and we're all getting lead poisoned and we're all somewhere house, the tip is going to happen and we're going to have to do something. We're going to have to make a change. Well, I mean, we're going to have to do something or not do something, you know, I mean, there's no, there's no rule that says the disasters can't get worse forever. That's not a rule. I just read that climate change is going to cause is probably going to cause more war. Yes. Just what we need more war. Uh, just uh, since you said you're not a seer, I'll try a counter counterfactual, so a historical counterfactual based on something you said before, Bill. So if Obama hadn't disbanded the, his, uh, you know, all, all all of the incredible, as you said, grassroots work, and you are, if you've got even more, if, if we actually have democracy in that way and then really build it up so it is the people, do you believe that that could bring about change or is it just not possible within the current system? Well, no, I mean, there's, there's hundreds of people who think that's the answer and Marianne Williamson, almost all the Democratic candidates are arguing that one way and another um, and it's certainly cogent. Uh, but whether, whether or not it's structurally possible is another issue. Uh, I'm gonna get to voting in just a moment. Um, but the, it, it, the, the cataclysmic question, Margaret's question, um, well, it, it, the most recent cataclysm was 9-11, and the government played that to our real detriment, inculcating fear, starting wars, telling us to go shopping, uh, building the police state. Uh, and if you didn't have an American flag on your house or your car, you were, and, uh, I don't know what and, you were. And, and the sad thing was that so many people accepted that or even bought into it, okay? Now we're here, we're here in 2019. We're 100 days from the Iowa caucuses, we have I don't know how many Democrats we have running for, at this point, 10 or so. Uh, most of them very good people. Almost any of them would be better than Trump in the, in the White House. Uh, whether any of them can get there remains to be seen. Uh, but there is, there is that potential for real hope and real structural change. I mean, Elizabeth Warren uses that phrase real structural change. Bernie's been talking about serious structural change for his whole life. Um, there, are, there are others who are less, well, in my hostile accounting, they, they are less aware of where, just how bad things are. <laughs> uh, or they're just too political to, to have the courage to just deal with it. Um, but we'll see. I mean, right now, one of the things that's happening uh, in the underbrush is that the Democratic establishment is looking for someone to replace Biden as the safe candidate. Well, you know, that is so destructive to the country. 
It is just the wrong, wrong thing to do. And yet, you know, how do you, how do you keep them from doing it? You know, you, you get out and you vote for the people who that, that represent change. But it's an uphill battle. I mean, Bernie was, was trashed by the Democratic establishment during, during that campaign. I mean, Hillary may very well have won a fair uh, uh, primary, but she, there wasn't a fair primary. So, um, so and, and the election thing, I mean, I, I wrote a piece in March of 2017. Everybody was carrying on, and still they still are, about how the Russians are such a threat to American elections. And I say that's really false. They are a threat but they are such a minor threat compared to all the other threats, the bigger threats. I mean, the Russians or any, any other uh, cyber attacking nation, um, no matter what they do, they cannot in, in a well-run state actually change votes. It's just out of their reach. Uh, Danny, you, you, you might have more insight on the, the, the technological part of that. Uh, but voting machines that are offline can't be hacked. So, uh, but the problem with politics, money in politics, dark money, which has been just getting worse and worse. Uh, corrupt fundraising from corporations and individuals was one of the major elements in Nixon's 1972 Watergate scandal. In spite of reform attempted through the previous year's Federal Election Campaign Act. Post-Watergate reforms passed Congress and were inadequate, leading to the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002, more for informally known as McCain-Feingold which the, the Supreme Court partially uh, undid. Uh, and of course, it didn't work. Uh, voter caging is you know, one of the problems. And one reason I think voting doesn't get the coverage it, can, it should get is because it's not a national story in a way that national media can handle. It's a national story, but it's 50 different states running 50 different election systems, some of which are better than others. Danny. But as a nation, we accept corruption. We, we think it's perfectly fine that, uh, that corporations can put money in, that lobbyists can put money in, that all these, all these, uh, all these various uh, Politicians are will are more than happy to take your money in order to be able to sway a vote. And until we get money out of politics, we're not going to be able to affect any kind of decent change on almost anything. And you can name health care, you can name any number of things. But that it seems to me that we're not going to get squat done until that is addressed. No, no, I, 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 um, I agree with you, except that, that we're all fine with it, or that most of us are fine with it. I think. If you had any kind of national plebiscite on money and politics, we'd have clean elections. But, you know, we're not going to get that. It's not a number one priority. It doesn't no. seem to me. No. Uh, but it's, it's a, it's a multifaceted attack on the voting system, and it's been going on for decades. Uh, voter caging, Florida's efforts to take Democratic voters off the rolls and intimidate them at the polls, in 2000, were state policy under Governor Jeb Bush and his Secretary of State, Catherine Harris. Without corrupt preparation of the, of the Florida, state of Florida, George Bush probably would have lost it outright. The closeness of the vote led to cha the chaotic recount and also abetted by Bush and Harris and it ended up setting up the opportunity to win the pro presidency in the courts. That gave us Bush v. Gore. And it was Bush who took it to the Supreme Court. And the 2000 Supreme Court's 5-4 partisan decision awarded the presidency to the loser of the popular vote 
Al Gore, another beneficiary of great wealth and wealthy leadership of the Democratic Party, chose not to contest this all-American effort to undermine Ameri the American electoral system. The Russians didn't have anything to do with that. Nobody did except us. The Supreme Court ruled, in effect, that elections could be fairly decided without counting all the votes. That continues as a cloud over the election system. Citizens United. In January 2010, another partisan 5-4 decision by the Supreme Court held, upheld the notion that somehow money is speech and those who have the most money are entitled to the most speech, allowing an already corrupt system to spin out further out of control. Despite their control of both houses of Congress, Democrats responded impotently and went on to lose the House in the fall. Voter suppression. What Jeb Bush oversaw in Florida in 2000 looks almost benign when compared to more recent Republican voter suppression efforts. And they continue to expand almost unchecked, even when courts rule them illegal. Republican state legislatures bring them back in, modern, in modified form. That happened in North Carolina. The, the Supreme Court said, uh, no, this is not a, a constitutional setup you have. They went back and did it the, more or less the same thing in a different way. Uh, and North Carolina is still very much in play. Uh, I mean, there was just a special election that was caused by Republican uh, corruption, forcing a, 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 a re-election. What? The suppression of black voters as well. Yeah, well, I mean, that's... Stacey yeah. Adams, she was... Uh, yes, that's Georgia. Oh, is it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just as bad. Uh, gerrymandering, already out of control place, in places like Texas, where Representative Tom DeLay stage managed the Texas legislature's efforts to redraw draw districts that increased Republican election winners. Anybody remember that? It was 10 years ago or more, 20 years ago, was it? And the response of the body politic was, oh, my goodness, how did he do that? And it stood. I mean, Texas has been corrupt for at least since then. Uh, as early as 1998, DeLay was the beneficiary of contributions from Rus Russian oil oligarchs. Oh, so maybe it was the Russians. <laughs> <laughs> DeLay, was, uh, DeLay was convicted and acquitted on appeal of conspiracy to violate election law in 2002. Gerrymandering has historically been a bipartisan group activity, but the ruthlessness of recent gerrymandering across the country is a Republican phenomenon to which Democrats have responded limply, if at all. Now, of course, in Vermont, ger gerrymandering is, is fairly limited. We have one, one House member for the whole state <laughs> uh, and two senators, but this same district. Uh, I guess there's been some, some chicanery at some level on the Senate, state Senate. And, House, but it, as far as I know, it's not been it's not been unusual. What? Huh? Seems to me the Republicans have institutionalized gerrymandering. If they get control of the state, they're going to gerrymand. Yeah. No, I, and I, the Republic and the Democrats would like to do the same thing, but they're, they're not organized well enough to get going. On. <laughs> well, that's the cynical view. I'm not sure it's actually true, Dick. I was on the Senate's reapportionment committee uh, last time out. I was hoping you'd say something. I, and I can say I personally take responsibility for adding a Republican town to the Windsor County Senate District. <laughs> <laughs> and my, my positioning in subsequent elections has gone down because we had constitutionally had to make the numbers work. And, and that was a duty. And, and I'm not a hero. I'm typical. Okay, well, the people simply did their duty in Vermont. I think we're. I think we are very different from the from the nation. Very much different from the nation. Yeah. Um, did, did did everybody understand Dick's point? That he was he's a state senator, and he was on uh, the commission to reapportion the state. Reapportion the senate. Reapportion the senate senate districts, yeah. and uh, added a Republican town to Windsor County which is his home county, and he's a Democrat. So he says he's not a hero, but he did the right thing. Well, I'm saying my colleagues generally do the right thing. Yeah. I'm not a woman. 
Yeah, no, I understand. Uh, no, I mean, Vermont... I admire you for that, but I don't think Vermont is the, is the showcase for, for the country for this project. Or oh. not, not typical, you mean? No. Yeah. Not, ty not typical. Maybe a showcase, but not typical. <laughs> Okay, another element in, in, in corrupt voting across the country, voting machines, um, although that seems to be past its peak at this point, partisan controlled, privately owned voting machines is a blatantly corrupt concept that we have lived with for a generation with little response. What is it? A voting machine? A voting machine is a computer that you vote by touchscreen. So there's no paper ballot. And the, certainly the early rounds of voting machines had software that voting officials were not allowed to see. And they went ahead with that anyway. Now, I, I, I'm, I'm not up to speed on, on where voting machines are right now, but it's my impression that, that they've passed their prime uh, and that I know Georgia, a federal judge in Georgia recently said, you cannot use machines that don't have a paper ballot. That was just recent. Um, I mean, it's a, it, it, it's a very simple thing. You, you can't have an honest recount without a paper ballot. It just, you know, it's, so why, why you would do anything differently um, means you're either stupid or dishonest, I think. Uh, maybe there's a third alternative. Uh, what? <laughs> Do those two go together, stupid and dishonesty? There's a Venn diagram. <laughs> uh, voter registration rolls. One of the things that, uh, if you know the name Chris Kobach, who was the, in, the Secretary of State in Kansas, I think, for a long time, uh, one of the things that Republicans are doing across the country is trimming voter registration vo rolls uh, by figuring out through some arcane uh, method that you may have moved or you're not the right person or whatever uh, based on two checks, your last name and your state or something like that. And uh, thousands of people have been taken off the voter rolls who are legitimate voters. Uh, but the the the, the system has been such that it's been targeted at minority voters, uh, poor voters, people who might vote Democrat. Uh, and it's been relatively effective. Uh, the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act of 1965 was a landmark of democratic expansion of the franchise to previously suppressed voting groups, especially black voters. According to legend, when President Johnson signed the act into law, he said he was going to lose the South for Democrats for a generation. Turned out to be longer. That was optimistic. In 2013, in another five to four partisan vote, effective, the Supreme Court effectively declared that racism was over and gutted the Voting Rights Act. As Chief Justice John Roberts myopically stated, our country has changed. While any rational discrimination in voting is too much, Congress must ensure that the legislation that passes to remedy that problem speaks to current conditions. So as a result of that, um, the, the North Carolina uh, legislature was one of the ones that took advantage of that and passed racist laws. Alabama, I don't know how many others. Um, Roberts is not known to have commented publicly as to the current condition of American bigotry as expressed by the Trump campaign and its followers, although his opinion in recent criminal cases are more sensitive to race than those of Justice Clarence Thomas. Once again, Democrats have taken the issue of voting rights and done little with it. 
Given the, this history of the self-inflicted collapse of American democratic process, the Russians seem to be relatively minor players of recent vintage. The greater threats to American democracy have by far been the Republican Party and the Supreme Court, with little resistance from Democrats. Together, our three branches of government have collaborated to create the corrupt conditions that spawned the Trump candidacy, an all-American target of opportunity the Russians were only too happy to work with. The Supreme Court and the President seem unlikely to deal with any of this anytime soon. That leaves Congress, and at this point, this time I was writing in, uh, what year was this? Uh, 2017, uh, which was the Congress, Republican controlled minority, majority, uh, to figure out whether the country is worth saving at this point. The starting point should probably be keeping Americans from interfering with the American democratic process. Uh, a, a word about the, the Russians. Um, from the get-go, I was dubious uh, of, of most of the claims about Russian interference. Not that it happened, of course it happened. There was collusion, uh, tacit if not deliberate, and there was obstruction of justice later. Those are, those are I'm sure, true. Uh, but, but whether the Russians had any significant impact on the results of the presidential election or any other election has, as far as I'm concerned, has not been shown. There are too many other reasons it came out the way it did. Uh, not least Hillary not going to Wisconsin or Michigan. Uh, I mean, th those are supposedly democratic states and she passed them up. Uh, I think that's all I need to say about uh, voting. Well, I think you always have the question with the Russians, though, in this, in this election, it was close. What? <coughs> the Russians, it was close. Um, there, were, there were a lot of factors that may have done it. I don't think they were by themselves, but they, but they definitely were a factor, I think. So, so trying, trying to, in my opinion, trying, trying to knock them off is, is not, not one of the reasons is, is it accurate. But that's my feeling. Okay, look, what, what, what are the Russians accused of doing in terms of, of influencing the vote? They're accused of targeting people on Facebook by you know, working their prejudices and their biases and so on and so forth. Uh, fine, everybody does that. I mean, there's, uh, there's no, uh, there's no, there's no uh, study that I'm aware of that's persuasive that, that demonstrates that Facebook advertising really is determinative. Everybody believes in it, so maybe it is. But, but how do you measure the impact of a Facebook ad on someone who is probably not spending too much time on it and may or may not vote? I mean, the connection is missing. How, was the vote changed? Maybe. They, they, what they were targeting, though, if they were targeting biases that already existed, it seems more likely that the impact was reinforcement, not change. I think it's just as dangerous to say, them, to say that they're not a factor as it is to say they were a factor. I just don't think we know. That's what I'm saying. We don't know, but, we, but, but culturally we spent years acting as if the Russians did it. And, and ignoring these other issues. What? Um, if there are any town clerks here, I apologize if I'm offending you, but I've been wondering, wouldn't it be possible for these people out there, like the Koch brothers who have billions of dollars, to approach 10 town clerks in Michigan and say to them, we're gonna give you $10 million if you ensure that your uh, district <clears throat> delivers the vote to Trump. Am I delusional about, I mean, couldn't that happen? 
Well, he, just, well, he just went back to Boston during my book early. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> he, he bought big blocks of books like yeah. that with money. Who what? And he was saying in Boston, Michael Curley bought Michael books. Curley a long time ago yeah. bought yeah. books. And they cost a dollar a piece. <laughs> okay. Um, there's no question that, that buying votes is, was an honorable American tradition <laughs> in, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. I'm, I'm not, I don't see the evidence that that's what's going on now. Uh, undoubted, undoubtedly, there's some, yeah. uh, but what you just described is is such an overt crime, right? That, that but if I were a little simple town clerk and I wanted my children to go to my grandchildren to go to college, I can't imagine thinking twice if somebody offered me ten million dollars. But you have to remember that there are safeguards built into any decent yeah. local election. They're both parties are observers. The count is, you know, no one person is allowed total control of the count, et cetera, et cetera. It, it, you've, got to, you've got to get quite a network going to, to influence a, 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 a well-organized democratic yeah, I, system. I say this because in the Bush-Gore election, I was a resident of Florida, wow. Sarasota, Florida. And my husband and I probably naively just went into the town clerk when we bought our house. and and said we'd like to register to vote, and we naively put down we were Democrats. It would have been smarter to say we were independents. But I have some evidence that she just threw away our ballot, our registration, mm. because when I requested a um, vote by mail ballot, it never came, and we had jobs in Indonesia, and um, we never mm. received them. And after the election, I went back to that town clerk, I, that person wasn't there, but I said to one of her assistants, um, can you see if my name is registered to vote? And she said, no, you, you don't exist. So I'm very sure that woman... What county? It was Sarasota. It was, uh, Kathleen Harris lives in Sarasota, by the way, Catherine Harris. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I had a, I actually did have my registration thrown away by a town clerk, so I think that's why my mind goes to that. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm not saying those things don't happen. Yeah. What, what, what I don't believe is they happen on a, a, a significant scale yeah. compared to these other things. I mean, it's just, it's just so much easier to have a computer program that knocks out voters that you don't want voting in, in a district. Uh, and it's a much better place to put your money, and the Cokes are good at that. Mm -hmm. As your outlook is on the bleak side, <laughs> is there anyone that you trust about the truth and anyone who is a sort of role model for you that you believe in? that says something that um, affects you and, and, and you think, ah, that's it, he's got it or she's got it. Uh, Anybody? Yeah. Um, certainly democracy now, the people on democracy now are, are largely reliable. The Intercept, largely reliable. Um, I mean, I don't trust anyone universally because people, all people make mistakes. You don't right? trust anyone? No, not, trust not all the time. I don't, you know, no one is perfect. Uh, there was, I, I mean, one of my favorite stories recently was uh, Tyler Durden on Zero Hedge uh, ran a story uh, based out of, I mean, it, it, it came out from a Ukrainian legislator, I think, that, that uh, Joe Biden had received a $900,000 payment. And I thought, great story but I couldn't find it anywhere else. But it had, it had legitimate looking backup. But since I I'm not good in Ukrainian, I couldn't tra trace it any further. <laughs> no, but I mean, just down there, simple television that a lot no, of people watch, is there somebody or s that you believe in, that you think, aha, 
there's the answer. They've well, got something. No, I gave, I gave you two. Uh, but I mean, I don't know what those programs are. Well, they, see, that's part of the problem. I mean, I, I do not, I, I went cold turkey on uh, broadcast and cable news about five years ago. Um, and I don't feel like I've missed much. Yeah. Uh, I, I get a lot of, of stuff uh, uh, in, on the internet. I, I, have more e I get more news emails than I sh can ever look at. Um, and I mean, and I, I do read the New York Times uh, because I, ever since I was a kid, I've known that reading the New York Times is important because that's how you know what the enemy is up to. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, you don't watch uh, MSNBC anymore? I don't. Gosh. So you don't think, I mean, Rachel Maddow is kind of, not, we kind of rely on her. Yes, we yeah. do. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I, I, I guess with Rachel Maddow, and this is totally subjective, I guess, I, I lost serious confidence in her with her book about how the military is such a wonderful thing. Yeah. And I thought, well, no, it's more nuanced than that. <laughs> uh, oh. so, so your programs what, are online? Are you saying or what? There's one on the radio that you mentioned to no, oh. now. What, what I'm saying is that I am a voracious, voracious reader multi-sourcing, and I don't trust anything that I only hear once. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let me, give you, let me give you an example of a current thing that's developing. Um, Nancy Pelosi announced that uh, we were going to have an impeachment, right? On, uh, on September 24th, she said, therefore today, I am announcing the House of Representatives is moving forward with an official impeachment inquiry. I am directing our six committees to proceed with their investigation under that umbrella of impeachment inquiry. The president must be held to account. No one is above the law. Okay, largely unobjectionable. But I, I wrote in the piece, what does impeachment mean to Democrats? They don't say. And what I wrote was, this is not encouraging, what Pelosi said. The country has been in a deepening constitutional crisis for more than two stormy decades, and now, belatedly, the speaker is proposing an umbrella. Okay, I'm a smart ass. Uh, <laughs> Even less encouraging when the speaker announces an umbrella of an impeachment inquiry, the political and media classes respond as if they're going to a New Year's Eve party rather than undertaking a serious constitutional duty. An umbrella made up of six committees? How is that supposed to work? It's been raining for a long, long time. Since the moment the current president was sworn in, he has been committing more and more impeachable offenses. After more than two and a half years of open corruption, the most thoughtful response we can get from the U.S. House of Representatives is an umbrella of six committees with no formal framework. The speaker is playing political word games, and she's surrounded by enablers equally uncommitted to being frank and honest. What is, quote, an official impeachment inquiry, unquote. Exactly. It's nothing. It's three meaning-free but impressive sounding words that reinforce the status quo. The status quo is whatever those six, six committees are up to. We don't really know what, it, what that is because they aren't eager to explain and reporters aren't eager to inquire. An official impeachment inquiry is actually nothing but empty words that give some sort of cover to those carrying it out, whatever it turns out to be. We shall see, but I am not encouraged. And uh, within a couple of days, I was on the radio and uh, I got off this line. When impeachment becomes a sudden fad, 
with no clear grounding in principle and a narrow focus on pretty much circumstantial evidence grounded in a bed of bipartisan corruption resting on tectonic plates of the new Cold War, I remain detached and skeptical. Now, it might be a spectacular show, especially if viewed from another planet, or maybe just from China. Uh, <coughs> But my point is that how, I mean, just off the top of your head, how many impeachable offenses, how many areas of impeachable offenses can you think of that Trump has engaged in? You know, it's, it's not a challenging question. And they decide to go with Ukraine. What is it, 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 my first reaction was, okay, this is a Biden protection move. Although, uh, although it's tricky. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, but I know I'm not the only one who thinks that. Uh, there's Colleen Rowley. Anybody know who she is? She was, a, uh, she was an FBI official in 2001 and, and, there, and earlier. She tried to get her, her superiors to pay attention to what she knew about the people who ended up blowing up the World Trade Center, and she, and she couldn't get a hearing. Because mm, she really knew. Hmm? She really knew something. Yeah, she was an FBI agent. She was, you know, she was on the case. Well, why did they listen to her? It's one of the mysteries of 9-11. And there, you know, that's not the only instance of that. There's two or three or four people out there who knew stuff, and it's just the... the, the the dots were not connected, and partly they were not connected because nobody wanted to try and connect them. And it's not at all clear why. I don't know why. Uh, but here's what, here's what she said uh, about, about the impeachment, the, the current impeachment activity. The jury is still out, but there are many odd circumstances involving the Ukraine, Ukraine gate complaint. I even find suspicious how Pelosi pulls on, puts on her act of being so scandalized. Has she ever uttered a word about much more serious past incidents of presidential level collusion with foreign countries, i.e. Nixon's thwarting of LBJ's Vietnam peace negotiations in 1968, which resulted in years more war and war casualties, or Reagan's pre-election meddling in 1980 to keep Iran from releasing the US hostages until the day of his inauguration? Pelosi and the other pro-impeachment Democrats have called for prosecution of war crimes, war crimes whistleblowers, Manning, Snowden, and others, as well as WikiLeaks editor Assange. But in this one unique display, reeking of political partisanship, they put the CIA agent source up on a pedestal. All these hypocrisies seem to be adding up to and point to something very rotten in Washington, D.C. Uh, I mean, we, we have no idea where, where any of this is going, but uh, impeachment, uh, impeachment is just an indictment, or a collect, in this case, it should be a collection of indictments, uh, accusations of wrongdoing supported by evidence. Uh, the process of impeachment is uncodified. Uh, the, the Constitution says the House can do it and doesn't say how the House has to do it. And if the House does bring a bill of impeachment, then the Senate has to have a trial and the accused has to have a judgment. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a situation where any prompt impeachment will give us President Pence, okay? Uh, which doesn't seem like a really good outcome. Uh, more complicatedly, but I haven't, seen, I haven't seen anything to make this seem likely, but more complicatedly, it could give us President Pelosi. She's third in line, second in line, whatever it is, however, however long the line is. Uh, and there are those who want this impeachment to be swift. And I don't understand that. What does speed get you 
in an impeachment process in the context we're in, where we get President Pence or we get a, a president acquitted. I mean, an acquitted Trump running for re-election in 2020? I mean, does anybody want that? <laughs> <laughs> really? You can be impeached and then run? Okay, impeachment is an accusation. Then it goes to the Senate. The Senate then has a trial, and he's either convicted or acquitted. Now, it's a, all, it's a Republican Senate. There's been very little sign of, of attrition uh, so far. Could happen. But the, to, to, it, as things stand right now, an acquittal in the Senate is a good bet. It's, Huh? Sure thing. I don't think it's a sure thing, but that's because we're here now and it's going to happen then. Uh, but it, it's as close to a sure thing as, as things get, I think. Uh, what? I saw that they can also, uh, they can disqualify him from future public office. Oh, no. Yeah, but that, that helps us now how? <laughs> uh, well, maybe they could do it even without the, even with the acquittal. Uh, no, I mean, the process is the process. He gets acquitted, he's still in office. But can he run 2020? Oh, yeah, he's good. No, he, he can't. He, if they, they can disqualify him from running in, in into a public office. That's conviction. We're talking about a Republican Senate saying that their 2016 winner can't run again? No, I don't think so. Bill, so um, in terms of the, the, I hear what you're saying about the, sh the speed with which it would be, we, 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 the speed with impeachment now, I hear your point. So what, what would you like the timing to be or just as long as it takes? Just whatever it takes. Okay. Thank you for asking that question. I'm glad I planted it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I haven't seen anybody else write about this. It's not such an outrageous idea that it's not out there. I just haven't seen it. Uh, but we are where we are with facing a, a possible President Pence or some other disastrous result. Nobody says impeachment has to be in a hurry. That's not a rule. It's not even a tradition. It's not even a precedent. It's nothing. Impeachment can take as it long as it needs to take. And in this case, with this president, there's more than enough substantive offenses to carry this impeachment inquiry into November of 2020. There's absolutely no reason it can't be done. And it, there's no reason it can't be organized with serious people uh, running serious subcommittees, uh, not even necessarily Congress people, raising issues that we know matter. Not just emoluments, but the rule of law. The president, one federal judge said uh, in, in a ruling, one thing you can't do, Mr. President, is rewrite the law all by yourself. And he's been doing that right and left. The, the Trump administration has been doing that right and left. Uh, the, and it hasn't been explored in any systematic way. And I believe if it were, if, if a handful of people had the courage and the authority, that means the Democrats in the House, uh, to do that, we could see a very, very different country. Because the truth does matter. It just doesn't matter enough right now. Does it occur to you why they're rushing it? Uh, you know, I try not to read minds. Uh, I mean, I already said I thought it was a Biden cover, you know, cover, cover Biden's ass thing, but that, uh, I don't, I don't have a reason to believe that's true. That's just me being suspicious and cynical. Uh, because, I mean, and the rationale for that is Biden's relationship to Ukraine is, it may be legitimate, but it's impure. And 
he's a weak enough candidate that that being a point of attack, which clearly Trump people wanted to make, why wouldn't they? Uh, it's something that, that the Democrats would want to head off. But for a, for, for a vice president of the United States to have a son working for a corrupt oligarch at $50,000 a month, that's, at best, that's not good optics. <laughs> and he should have known better. Yeah. And he didn't. And whether there's any more to it than that, I don't know. But it, it, it's a vulnerability. He's, he's not clean as a hound's tooth. Uh, that's why I think, think that, that, that there's, there's something involved there. Because why did it come up so suddenly at that point? I mean, the, I mean Mick Mulvaney, the, the chief of staff, was, was, was right. In a sense, we do this all the time. Um, now, we don't do exactly this all the time. I mean, I, I, I'm not aware of any other example of a president asking for dirt on a potential opponent. <laughs> But it, it wouldn't surprise me if, if, it, if it had happened. Uh, but that's really all there was in that Ukraine conversation uh, that they're hanging their hat on. Uh, it's, so it's not a really principled impeachment inquiry in that sense, um, especially given all the other things that are so much more uh, I mean, he threatened nuclear war, right? He, he, he continues to support the Saudis in the genocidal war in Yemen. Uh, he, he undermines the Kurds and then just says, well, we're going to occupy the oil fields, although he doesn't have Congress, congressional authority to do that. I mean, all of these are much more important than, than getting dirt on Biden. And there's millions more, right? Uh, I mean, it just, it, it, an exhaustive impeachment inquiry covering all the things that matter would take years. They only have to dress, stretch it out till November. But you know, this country's got so many smart people, and yet this Trump thing, I'm an outsider. I had a dinner party last week, and my God, the whole, everybody was talking about Trump. What a creep, what a horrible, I'm getting the hell out of here. This was the sort of talk, and I thought to myself, gosh, when he first came in, I thought, wow, this guy looks like some comic strip character, you know, blonde Superman's going to protect everybody. He's not a he's not a politician. He's a businessman. He'll know how to do it. Huh. And and then slowly, you know, uh, uh, I thought, mm, yeah, uh, all this hate, hate, hate. Has he done anything that's worthwhile? I caught him on television. I was looking for the fires. A friend of mine has a, a son who's had to uh, evacuate three times from California to get, and he's lost his business, and it's just awful. And I turned on the next day to see the fires on CNN. I never watched daytime, and there was Trump praising the air, uh, the uh, police force, and the officers that protect all of us, giving out medals and whatnot. And it was really impressive how he loves the the, the police force and how he, you know, was. Um, bringing them all up on the stage, letting them talk, and guys that were first responders to some hideous thing that was going to happen and shot the guy and, and, and were such heroes. I'm just thinking, hasn't he done anything that you can praise him for? <laughs> <laughs> he, 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 he hasn't started a war with Iran. Uh -huh. yeah. That's true. And one of his buddies with Kim Jong-un, is that not good? Yeah. He got us out of TPP. What? The tree. You build the wall. You won't have the opioids anymore. He, he's a Nazi. He's a Nazi. <laughs> yeah. What do you yeah. more you need to say? Yeah. Well, about two nights ago, and it came up on my husband's computer, uh, something about bombers going over, and I was like in this panic, thinking, "Oh no, we are going to bomb Iran." And then I looked on NPR and I looked on BBC, and there was nothing. But it, it popped up, and it showed these guys working on the bombers and everything, and it, 
Was there anything anywhere about those bombers? Yeah, trust but verify. No, I had no idea. No, didn't see that story. It wasn't about the Dami or whatever his name is, you know, the capture of the ISIS leader. It wasn't that. Dan? I, I think I don't know if we disagree or not, but, but the whole Ukrainian, Ukrainian thing to me is could be just what it appears to be, which is that um, it, it was it was handed to the people. It's the Biden kid was involved. Um, Biden himself was involved. They were looking for the dirt to do that. They then made some apparently made some mistakes, and some fairly important people. Um, were willing to, to start making un, un, statements. I, I just think the thing developed very naturally. And, and, and be, because it developed, and it wasn't the biggest thing to decide that that's the reason why, why there's some kind of dishonesty, I, I just don't see it. I think it developed because it's provable. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that was the main reason. I think, uh, you know, I mean, honestly, the, the whole Syri pulling out of Syria, and if you link that to Trump, the twin Trump Towers in Istanbul, I mean, there's way more there in terms of damaging the country and killing thousands of people and so on. But provability on that one is, is not as going to be as easy as what seemingly uh, this is. So. I don't know, a monument wasn't that hard and isn't that hard to see. I mean, he brags about it all the time. Oh, never mind, it's not going to be my hotel, my hotel after all. People because you all were so care. mean to me. I agree with you, you but mean? people don't seem to care. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we didn't pull out of Syria. We're, we're still in Syria. Uh, and I don't think we, there was ever a time when we weren't in Syria. We just, mo we just moved the pieces around. Uh, as, far as, as far as the organic development of the Ukraine story, yeah, I agree with that. Um, I'm, I still assume that the CIA whistleblower is a real person who lodged a, 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 a report in full integrity. Uh, uh, the, the colonel who was the Ukraine expert uh, at the National Security Council just testified today that he heard the call and reported it to two superiors at the time. So yes, no problem that that is a real thing as far as I'm concerned. It's a question of scale. It's a question of priority. It's a question of what really matters. If Trump goes down for trying to get dirt on Biden, everything else he's done gets sort of ratified. Uh -huh. And that's, that's terrible for the country. We don't have a, a, a legal system that, that commits what you're talking about. Yes, we do. We have a legal system called the Congress. They can run an impeachment any way they want, and they can take up the most serious issues any time. Well, Congress, though, is split very evenly and do not support going in that direction. So you get the reality of the reality. And, and it's shameful. Okay. Okay? That's my whole point. None of us would disagree with that. Uh, you know, you have, you have, a, I mean, that's why, w w uh, I think it was a staff member for Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez said that the democratic establishment is the biggest threat to world peace today. Now he was uh, obviously doing a, a, a exaggerating for effect, uh, but in a very real sense, that's true. So say it again. For the, 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 the establishment Democrats are the biggest threat to, to, you know, to world order, or I forget his exact phrase, but what he meant was it, they are the knot that is keeping us tied down right now in the situation we're in. And it's the democratic leadership that thinks it's a good idea to do a Ukraine impeachment, yes. not, not an impeachment on all the more substantive issues. Uh, I mean, climate change. If Trump is not impeachable on climate, on the climate crisis, he's not impeachable on anything. Not I mean, that's not he's he's not carrying out his his oath of office to faithfully well, execute no, the laws. He's not right. carrying out his his oath of office to faithfully execute the office of the president. Uh, I, I mean, it's his job to be the president of the United States, and he's being the president of Trump Inc.
Mm -hmm. I would forget the following guy. He is president of the United States, and 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 he will he will pull the bullshit lying lying um, uh, reasons of, of why climate change isn't there, and he's and he's backed by a substantial part of the Congress in the same way. How the hell are you going to develop that? You know, that's what we've been fighting. Who, I, I don't who, know has, who has the majority? Who has the authority? Who has the power? Who has no courage? They, have, they can have the power and indict him to that, and then it would get to the Senate, and they're not going to convict him. That's why I say don't send it to the Senate. It's exactly why I say don't send it to the Senate. It's exactly. You just impeach him, impeach him, impeach him, because you can do it, and there's no one who can say these are not legitimate issues and, st and, and tell the truth. You had said it would be a, it would be it would be like a like a teach-in, like a like a national teach-in yeah. if it were handled well. That, that would be. And that, people would go, oh, oh. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Interesting. I mean, it, it, see, a, a a conscientious impeachment over a long period of time mm -hmm. would pull together these things that we all know fragmentarily into a really serious pattern, mm -hmm. and we'd have to think long and hard and hope we had a candidate to vote for in November that would you know, help us out of this. You do start to see a breakdown in some of the ways that, that, uh, that he's able to defend himself. Not totally, for sure. Like, he's still able to get the press that we were talking about before, but the, the, as, as you were saying, Nancy, with the emoluments, it seems so clear. And he says the so-called emoluments clause. Yeah. And it's not really working for him, but he's trying to do that. Whereas in the past, that stuff would just, that stuff would just work for him in the past, and it's not now. So, your point, Bill, about is there, if, it, if there's more time, do people start to, and they, they handle it the right way, do they, do they start to take more time? I do think, obviously, the election creates a mess out of this, and the ongoing election, I think, has, but, but I see your point, and that's part of the thing. There's so many mixed feelings about that. If I thought there was any chance of changing minds, I would be much more enthusiastic. Oh. When, when, you, when you listen to his, his, his supporters, when you watch his rallies, when you meet them one-on-one -on -one and talk to them, the rest of it, the man is incapable in their eyes of doing anything wrong and is the one who's right and is being screwed by the government. And I don't think anything you do, and I'm, I'm just being very, very pessimistic, but anything you do is going to change that. No, no, and, and you know what? We need more that doesn't matter. You don't have to change his mind. If I'm right, you don't have to change his mind. You don't have to change his supporters' minds, uh, very many of them. Uh, you don't have to do that because you've got truth on your side and you've got the majority of the American people on your side. They're already there. They just haven't been organized. And, 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 and if Trump doesn't change his mind, I don't care. I mean, what Randy was saying about paying attention to Trump and, and so on all the time, that's one, been one of the chronic flaws of our culture since 2016, or since 2015 really, is this obsession with Trump yes. when Trump really doesn't matter in any good sense. Sure. And, and that he is allowed for various reasons and through various mechanisms to suck the air out of the room. And one of the things, one of the things that a ongoing continuous impeachment process would be would at, a, at, a, at, a, at a scale of seriousness that Trump has never been able to manage, having that go on month after month would be a counterbalance to, to the Trump cartoon show. I, I, I suppose what you're doing, but you still got to remember, as you know, that, that the Senate requires a two-thirds vote to convict. The Senate doesn't matter! Okay, well, you can still... I, I'm no. sorry. I'm the sorry, Senate doesn't mind. matter. In this scenario, the Senate doesn't matter. What? <laughs> Dick. Well, I'm going to disagree that Trump doesn't matter. I think that... Uh, okay, I, no, I, I agree with what you're going to say. Do I have that kind of hold on No, I was like, for example, the, the, the betrayal of one ally after another. Yeah, we are not, you and I are not going to live long enough to see the United States regain the respect of the world. No. We are a discredited nation, and 
elect a Democrat next time out, ele elect a progressive, you know, an, an independent, the world is going, doesn't know whether to laugh at us or be afraid of us, mm -hmm. or probably both. Okay, you have a buffoon, you know. No, it's I think, going, it's going but, to be a long run. But also the the environmental damage yes. that, that is being done yeah. right now. Yes. So profound. I, I think Trump matters a no, lot. A absolutely, Dick. I was I was I was arguing on a different ground. I was arguing on a, on a theatrical performance ground. His day after day after day tweet stuff that is idiotic stuff. And why we culturally focus on it is beyond me. We should be focusing on exactly the things you're talking about. You said money. Huh? Money from the channels. Or from no, it's easy. Trump makes it easy for us to detract, distract ourselves. He's a master distractor. So who do we start writing to to say, this is what we need you to do? Who, who in the government do we, do we write to? I, I can get a whole bunch of people to sit down and we'll send postcards and we'll start a movement. Come on. Come on, guys. So I, think the movement I, is, I, think, I think the movement is already there in at least some nascent form. Um, I mean, the, the, the new... The, the, the new Congress people from 2018, with the exception perhaps of Katie Hill, uh, uh, are, are a whole different bunch of people and they want a whole bunch of different things. Um, and their, their primary opposition is the d democratic establishment. Uh, Which is the majority. Yeah. Well, you know, that's not clear. Uh, uh, what you have, you know, you have what, how many Democrats? 245 Democrats, something like that. Uh, I think maybe a couple hundred of them now are, are on board with impeachment when a, when a while ago it was under 100. Uh, so I think, it's, I think it's a game in play. Uh, but it's a game that needs to be played if it's going to be won. And right now it's not being played that hard. Uh, I'm just working work, we're basically going to need to shut down the government. What? We have to shut down the government, nothing's going to get accomplished, which is fine, which is going to be accomplished except this. I don't think you're going to be able to maintain a, the, the government being able to pass laws and doing all the things it needs to do with what's going on. Which, I mean, that doesn't mean I'm not for it, but for the concept, but... Um, I, I, I'm not sure what your point is. You can organize an impeachment inquiry that doesn't interfere with running the, interfere with running the government. It's, it's totally doable. All you have to do is have, have the conviction and the authority. Be good counter-programming to all those tweets. That's, exactly. that's actually a really good idea. But who, who to write to? I don't know that there's any one person to write to. There's a whole bunch of people out there that are doing the right things, and you know it's networking as much as anything. I mean, I don't know. I, you know, I, I'm here. I'm here in Vermont with a book that doesn't sell. Well, you know. <laughs> okay, it's nice to know names. I, I would like to know names Pelosi. because it it could be a group, a group of people. Well, you can write to Pelosi, but you got to you know, it says the lady in front. Uh, how are we doing on time? Ooh. You're pushing the end of your time. <laughs> it's about uh, 20, 19 minutes. <laughs> so, Bill, to bring it back a little closer to home and make Vermont great again. <laughs> uh, yeah. Reflecting on Dick McCormick's comments. <laughs> For a few years, Vermont was an independent republic. Yes. Mm, yeah. How about we go back to that? <laughs> That Chuck is an evergreen futility. Or you can make like Killington and secede to New Hampshire. Well, I'm, uh, unless there's more to be said, I'm sort of, I feel peaked in, in both senses of the word. Um, how, what? How do we buy books? Uh, I have them here. Uh, <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> uh, and, and anybody, I don't want to shut this down if anybody has anything to say. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you.